Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you on this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, spring morning. And I know spring is not officially here yet, but uh, when the weather gets like this, in my book, we're there. Amen? Uh, we still have our little winters to go through, blackberry and dogwood, and I forgot what the other two were. But, um, but we'll take these days, won't we? I enjoy all the seasons. I hope you do as well. And uh, it's so good to see you. I wanted to start off with a passage of scripture this morning uh, in Romans chapter 8. Some of my favorite <coughs> verses, and I bet they are yours as well. In uh, chapter 8, beginning in verse 37. Boy, this is a word for us. And we look around at all the chaos we're going through in our world. It says, yet in these things, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Isn't that a good word? So we are more than conquerors. I'm so thankful we don't, as believers in Christ, we don't have to sit around downhearted and afraid and sad all the time because our God is with us. He never takes his eyes off of us and he loves us. Verse 38 says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a good word. Um, it's so good to worship with you today. To all of our guests, we thank you for coming to worship with us, to choose to worship with us. Uh, you bless us when you do that, and I hope that we're a blessing to you. I would love to ask you, if you would, uh, in your worship bulletin, is a little corner, that bottom right corner. It's called the connection card. If you would take a moment and fill that out for me, I would love to just know your name, have a record of your visit, and be able to pray over you. It tears out a little bit later in the service when the offering plate goes by. We just ask that you would drop that in the offering plate. Also, if you have any special prayer needs on the back of that same connection card, you can tell us how we can pray for you. And uh, it would be our joy to do that. Again, tear it out, drop it in the offering plate. And we will get those. We certainly want to be remembering our brothers and sisters uh, and the people of the Ukraine. And uh, we want to remember each other. We've got those that continue to go through cancer treatments and, and other things. Our list is always long. But we want to lift those up in prayer. And we'll pray a little bit later in the morning. But um, are you glad to be here? Are you ready to worship? All right, well, if you'd look at your neighbor, give him a smile and a wave, and we'll ask Benji to come on and lead us in our worship this morning. Psalm 100, verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Would you stand as we sing, He has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving
morning. Today's scripture will be in Joshua 1, verse 9. It says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Even though this is an old verse, it still remains true. No matter what the world is going through and no matter what you are going through, you never have to be afraid. For you can be strong and courageous because the Lord is with you. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for this day, Lord. Please help us all stand strong and be courageous, no matter what the world throws at us. Because we know that you are with us wherever we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you will, get your Bibles out this morning and your copy of God's Word. I know some of you, uh, like myself, have a copy like we've always had of God's Word. Some of you have God's Word on your uh, electronic device, on your phone. Um, you know, that was hard to get used to when it started happening because uh, preachers thought that <laughs> folks weren't bringing their Bibles and they were looking at their phone all through the message. And who would have thought that today we were able to carry the Bible with us everywhere we go. And uh, pretty amazing times that we live in. And listen, we have a lot of ills in our world, but you know what? We also have some good tools to use as believers. Well, today we're going to be in Revelation chapter 10. And as we continue our journey through Revelation, uh, last week was probably one of the hardest messages um, that I brought in Revelation as we dealt with, uh, we are in the time of the tribulation. And as we were looking at the judgments that were rolling out, we had already seen the seven uh, seals opened and the judgments that came with those. And then we went through the trumpets. And today as we come to chapter 10, if you remember back in chapter 7, we had what we called a, a little bit of a a break. We had an interlude of mercy, we called it, an interlude of grace, where God pulled back a little bit. And we can still see God's heart. And God's heart is always, he pursues people. God loves people. I want you to know something this morning. God loves you. And he pursues you. Even if you're far away from him, God loves you and he pursues you. And we saw that interlude, that that interlude of grace in chapter 7 where God pulled back and we saw his heart. His heart was to give men, women, boys and girls continued opportunities to come to faith in Christ and to repent of their sins. Well, today, praise the Lord, after a hard message last week, we're going to see another interlude of grace. This one will run through chapter 10 and on into Chapter 11, as we see the two witnesses who come on the scene in chapter 11, their purpose is to perform miracles and to point people to God. So all through Revelation, even though we see we're in a, the time of tribulation, God is still at work pursuing the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls because that's the kind of God we serve. Amen? And he is worthy of our worship and he's worthy of our praise. Before we go to the message this morning, though I did want to open with prayer. I was watching a video um, last night and this morning of a pastor, and he was asking for prayer. He was Ukrainian, and he was asking for prayer. He was asking our churches to pray for them. And God has answered and is answering many of the Ukrainian believers' prayers. Um, and he, he said, you won't hear all of this on the news, but there's, there have been tens of thousands of Russian troops that have lost their lives. The Ukrainian people have stood up, and they're a bold people, and they're a courageous people. They have also lost lives. Russia is targeting. Um, there have been civilians. Many civilians have lost their lives in the Ukraine. But yet, Russia has met with resistance that they did not anticipate with the Ukrainian people. The Ukrainians are asking us to pray. 
The Ukrainian believers are asking us to pray for God to cover them, to protect them, to help them. And so we want to do that, church. I want to be found faithful in that. But we also want to pray for each other because many of you are walking through difficult times and things, sickness in your families, cancer. Many are walking through cancer treatments. And so I want to open this morning with a time of prayer. And so don't be uncomfortable with it, but I want to spend just a moment in silent prayer with you there, your heart to God's heart. What I would like to ask you to do, you may not know the name of the person to your right or your left, or maybe you do, but I would like to ask you to pray for the people seated next to you. If they're across the aisle, then pray for them. And that way we will all be prayed for this morning. That's what we do as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what we should do. Everybody, no matter who you are, is walking through something. You never know what the person seated next to you is going through. We don't even know if they might be holding on to just a thread. So I want, with that in mind and that in heart, I want to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, and pray for your neighbors around you this morning. And then I'll come and pray. Father, as we quiet our hearts in your presence, Lord, you tell us in your word, Psalm 46, 10, to be still. Father, for some of us and for many in this room, we've not had a still moment all week. Father, we gather as your people, we gather as brothers and sisters in Christ to, to worship you, to remember, God, who you are, to praise you, to lift our hearts and our voices, to lift our prayers, to open our hearts to your word. Father, in a room this size with this many people, there's a lot of hurts. A lot of worry, a lot of fears, a lot of pain, a lot of questions, a lot of concerns. We want to sit still in your presence and know that you are God. And Father, we trust you in all of our mess, in all of our brokenness. In all of our questions, we trust you. Lord, I pray for everyone who is struggling. You know the need. And I pray that you would meet each one where they need you. Father, I pray that your hand would be upon our church family. Upon our guests and our visitors. We count them as family too. And Lord, I pray you would show yourself mighty and strong. Father, we remember our young men who were serving our country. Some of our own. Lord, we pray for. We pray for Isaac. We pray for Sam. We pray for Noah. We pray for Ryan. We pray for others who are serving our soldiers, Lord. 
And we pray that you would be with them in the days and the months to come. And Father, we pray that you would be with the Ukrainian people. Father, they're coming up against a huge foe. And they need your help. And they're asking for prayer. So Father, we lift them up. We pray, Father, what they can't do, you would come to their aid and help them. <clears throat> Father, I've even prayed that, that you would send angel armies to back them up and encourage them and strengthen them. But Father, I also pray for the Russian people. Uh, Lord, many who have no control over what's going on. But Father, I pray that you would also be with them. Pray for a peaceful solution to this war. And Father, we trust you. Father, I do pray you would cover and protect the troops. I pray, Father, that, that you would do great and mighty things and even... In times like these, Lord, that many would turn to Christ and be saved on both sides. <coughs> and Father, we, we will commit ourselves to continue to pray. We pray for our president. We pray for our leaders around the world. Lord, that you would give them wisdom. Father, that they would seek you. Father, above it all and in it all, we know we're in the last days and we know that you're sovereign. And so we bring our hearts around to trust you, to lay it at your feet. And Father, we pray that your will would be done. Help us to be faithful. Faithful to Jesus, faithful to follow, faithful to pray, faithful to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we go to your word today, Speak to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Well, as we, as we go to God's word this morning, you know, you don't have to look very long to know that the world isn't getting any better. Amen? Someone posted on Facebook yesterday, a friend of mine, they said, I'm pretty excited. Our lawn was approved. We're closing on a full tank of gas this weekend. <laughs> Has anybody bought gas in the last few days? You paid for it if you did. Well, it's not hard to see that the world's not getting any better. And yet, church, we are also living in wonderful days. Because here, we can continue to preach the gospel freely. And tell others about Jesus. And on that level, we are living in wonderful days. These are days when the Holy Spirit is at work. He's at work in the hearts of people. I wanted to tell you, I wanted you to rejoice with me over something because you are a part of it. A couple weeks ago, I was in Guatemala and I was visiting our church partners, uh, Pastor Jaime and Susana, and also Pastor Hector and Ingrid. Who were uh, Hector during COVID and all of that lost his job. And God began to do a work in Hector's heart and in Ingrid's heart. And they felt called to plant a church in a town that had no evangelical witness. And they, they felt God's call to that. And we've come alongside them to assist them a little bit and to pray for them. And I visited with them. They... They don't have a nice building like this. They have a cover, a roof. That's all they have. They have a pavilion. They've got the cross up in that pavilion. And they're meeting and they're gathering children. They're having a lot of success with children. But last week, this week, two men in that community were saved. And you are a part of that. Isn't God good? God's at work. God's at work. Now, but, but let me tell you, 
tell, let me tell you why that is so special. Because the men are the hardest to reach. Many of the men in these communities work in the sugarcane fields. They leave their houses at 4 o'clock in the morning. And they travel by truck to the fields. And they work out in the sugarcane fields all day. And then they have to travel a long way back. And many of them don't get home until 7 or 8 at night. They're not in church. Because they work six out of seven days. And on Sunday they're exhausted. So in the churches you see the, the wives and the mothers and the children. That's who you see in the churches. And the men are very difficult to reach. And so as I, we visited with them. We stood there in that pavilion. Ingrid and Pastor Hector and myself and David Singleton of E3 Volunteers. And a couple other men. And we prayed. And one of the prayers was that God helped them begin to know how to reach the men. And this week two men were saved. God's at work. He's not only at work there. He's at work here. And I'm thankful. Look around this morning. Do you know that as a church, we had one of the strongest attended Januaries since I've been here? February messed with us a little bit with people being sick with COVID and other things. But I praise the Lord because God's at work here. And people are open in these days and times we're living in. People are open to the gospel. And so listen, even in the hard, in the hard times, I'm thankful that God has given us good times for the purpose of sharing his word and the gospel. Today in our scripture. We're going to get that message. God is going to give us the message. You keep preaching. You keep telling people about Jesus. Because we need to keep the main thing the main thing. And not get distracted with all the little things. In the days we're living in. I don't want to waste my time with a lot of little things that distract us. I want to stay focused on telling people about Jesus, loving people, and preaching the gospel. Amen? And that's your mission as well. As a believer in Christ, your mission is to love those around you, to be an encourager, and to share your faith and to preach the gospel to your friends and your family and your neighbors. I was listening to... Uh, Johnny Hunt, and he said something. He said, this is the day God has given us before these terrible, tragic days of the tribulation times. And what he was saying, we need to work while we can work on the things that matter. We need to pray while we can pray. We need to love people while we can love people and share the gospel while we can share the gospel. Yesterday... Uh, listen, your preacher needs to be fed too. So, so I listened to uh, some good preachers too. And D Dr. David Jeremiah is one of my favorites. He was preaching about the same thing yesterday. He said he was speaking about these last days we're living in. And he said this. He said, not one more thing needs to happen on earth before the rapture of the church. The Lord could take us home at any moment. Maybe before this day is over, that would be okay with me. But I too want more to be saved. And if you're not assured of your own salvation, come to Christ while you can. If you aren't saved and born again, if you don't know your home is in heaven, come today. Hell is not a place you want to go, friend. The late great Vance Havner said this when he, he was talking about what we believe about the last days and the end times. And he said this, he said, the real test of how much we believe of prophetic truth is what we're doing to warn men that God's wrath is coming on sin. To believe the solemn truths of prophecy and then to make our way complacently through a world of sin and shame is not merely unfortunate, it's criminal. 
You and I, we have a responsibility to share the good news of Jesus Christ everywhere we can. Every day, I'm praying for opportunities to share the gospel right here at home. I'm looking for opportunities to put myself around people outside of, this, outside of these walls of this church. Outside of Shallow Hill, as I call it. And to be out in the community more among people who are lost. And they're all around. But I also want to be obedient to the gospel and the great commission that says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And if we don't go, who will? You say, well, that's our missionary's job. Do you realize we only have about uh, four, three to 3,500 international mission board missionaries on the field? And there are billions of people around the world. They can't reach all those people with the gospel. If we don't come alongside and help, We've got a work to do. That great commission was for every believer. Some of us can pray. Some of us can give. And some of us can go. We need to do it all. Because we don't have much time. And so. We need to do this while we can. I don't want to. Stand before the Lord. And he say, why didn't you bring more? Why didn't you tell more? I don't want him to say, Pastor, why did you spend so much time watching television? Why did you spend so much time doing this rather than praying and telling and going? Now, as we come to chapter 10. This chapter is one of divine mercy. And after last week, we need some mercy. We come to chapter 10, and it's one of divine mercy. In chapter 7, there was an interlude. I called it, it was called an interlude of grace that led to the conversion of 144,000 Jews, who then became the ones who carried the gospel. They took up the mantle. And so now, before the worst judgment that is yet to come, here in chapter 10, God reaches out in mercy yet again. We're reminded of 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 that says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's good news. God is long-suffering. What an awesome and loving and merciful God we have. God loves us and he pursues us. He loves you today. No matter your past, no matter your mistakes, no matter your sin, no matter if you come with questions or brokenness, no matter if you struggle, no matter if you're rich or poor, God loves every person. He loves you. And he wants to save the lost. Who are the lost? The lost are those who have never fully trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and the Lord of their lives. The lost are those that have never repented of their sins. They've never placed their faith in the Lord to save them. They've never been willing to follow the Lord in baptism. Now, I know baptism doesn't save anyone. But I always struggle when people aren't willing to be baptized because that's the first step of obedience. If you're not willing to take the first step of obedience to Christ, guess what? You're not following Christ. I'm going to just say it. Amen? When we're not willing to profess Christ publicly because we're worried about what people will think, we're not following Christ. We don't want to be identified with him. Amen? Now, I know that's getting a little hard, but sometimes we need heart. We need to wake up. And so have you been saved? Have you been born again? The Lord is long suffering toward us and he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Maybe today is your day. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. It's always a sense of urgency. All right, I've done preached and I haven't read the message yet. Let's go to chapter 10. 
Let's look at what God says in his word. This is John, and he says again a phrase that we've seen over and over. He said, I saw. God is showing him things. And he said, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had a little book open in his hand. And he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write. That's John speaking. I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. Let's just point out that right there we just saw grace. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. In other words, what he's saying, we've seen a lot of judgment already, but it's about to be wrapped up and it's not going to be good. There's no going to be no longer delays after this. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. In other words, God's work would be com completed. As he declared to his servants the prophets. And then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again. And said go take the little book which is, in, which is open in the hand of the angel. Who stands on the sea and on the earth. And so I went to the angel and I said to him give me the little book. And he said to me take and eat it. And it will make your stomach bitter. But it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. And then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it. And it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. That last verse blesses my heart because you know what he's saying. John Go, go preach. Keep telling. Keep preaching the gospel. And we see God's grace and we see his compassion. And so let's go back and go through this a little bit more. And the first thing I would mention to you this morning is that God's word comes with authority. John says, I saw and some translations say, then I saw. And this is what the vision that God gave him. And here he sees another mighty angel. Do you know that angels are mentioned more than 60 times in Revelation? Mighty or strong angels are mentioned three times. And the angel coming down from heaven is described as mighty, perhaps because... He is both majestic. We are given more description about this one particular angel than any other. And listen to what he said. I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven. And he was clothed with a cloud. And a rainbow was on his head. And his face was like the sun. And his feet like pillars of fire. So he was described as mighty because he is both majestic and mammoth. He was able to plant one feet on the ocean and one, feet on the, one foot on the land. He's the kind of angel we need over helping those Ukrainian soldiers this morning. Amen? But he was a mighty angel. You say, Pastor, do you believe in angels? I do believe in angels because the Bible teaches it. And I believe some of them are mighty. I believe some of them, the Bible says, we entertain angels 
unaware. Some of them may look like you or I. You may have encountered one and never knew it. Who came to your aid. Who came to encourage you at just a moment where you needed it. But God has his angels and they do his work and his bidding. And they are in service to the Lord. And so, so God sends this mighty angel and he comes down from heaven. You know, last week we, we looked at the demons that ascended out of the abyss in chapter 9. But this angel is God's servant descends from above. He comes to earth with great authority as God's ambassador. And he comes. And he is bringing yet further judgment. He's going to pronounce yet further judgment. We looked at some of the judgments last week. We've been through the seven seals. We've been through the trumpets. The description of this angel recalls um, the vision of the exalted Christ in chapter 1. He's not the Christ, but this vision kind of reminds you of that, that John had. Whoever, uh, however, this is not the Christ, but his, his representative, God has sent this angel to represent him and to bring this message and these judgments. Some think that it could possibly be Michael, the great prince. We're not told exactly. And we don't know exactly. But there was a fourfold description given of this angel. He was surrounded by a cloud. That symbolizes glory. That symbolizes majesty and power. It recalls the coming of the Son of Man that we studied way back in Daniel chapter 7. Remember God led Israel by a cloud in Exodus chapter 16. Dark clouds covered Mount Sinai when the law was given in Exodus 19. God appeared to Moses in a cloud of glory in Exodus 24. And indeed the Bible says in Psalm 104 verse 3, He makes the clouds his chariot, walking on the wings of the wind. Nine of the twenty occurrences of clouds in the New Testament are connected with judgment. This angel comes in a cloud. And he comes to bring judgment. And so. There is also a rainbow over his head. I love this part. When you think of a rainbow. What do you think of? You think of God's covenant. It's a sign of God's covenant. Of his faithfulness. It echoes the story of Noah and the flood. It adorned his head like a crown. John MacArthur says this. He says, while the cloud symbolizes judgment, the rainbow represents God's covenant mercy in the midst of judgment. And we've seen both. God is going to come and he is going to judge sin. But even in that, he's a God of love and mercy. And even in this interlude in chapter 10 and as we go into chapter 11, as God sends his two witnesses to perform miracles and to continue to point people to God, we see his mercy. And so this angel had the rainbow. It said his face was like the sun, brilliant and radiant, for he had been in the presence of God. Remember Moses when he came off of Mount Sinai? He was radiant because he had been in God's presence, this angel had been in the presence of God and his face was like the sun. And so he is an awesome reflection of the Lord. His legs were like fiery pillars, a picture of stability and uncompromising holiness. Wow. We're going to get to see these angels one day. We're going to worship. But I want you to notice something else. This angel comes and it's very interesting what happens. Because he cries with a loud voice. And as when a lion roars. And he cried out seven thunders uttered their voices. And thunder, remember when you hear it thunder you think of an approaching storm. And so these seven thunders, we just 
We just witnessed the seven seals as Christ opened the scroll with the seven seals. And each time a different judgment rolled out. And then we had the seven trumpets. We've not had the seventh one yet. And as, as those trumpets blew, they brought more judgment. Well, this angel comes with seven thunders. It's interesting. Uh, now, if, if you know your prophecy and you've studied Revelation, you know there's the... The seals, the seven seals, there's the seven trumpets, and then coming in chapter 16 is going to be the, the seven bowls, which are the worst of the worst. Did you know there were seven thunders? Now we're going to see grace. We're going to see God pulling his hand back. I want you to notice what happens. Now, when the seven thunders uttered their voices, verse 4, John says, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and do not write them. God stayed his hand. And could it be that that was an act of God's mercy and grace? Not bringing those seven thunders. What we've seen already. And God stays his hand. But then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land. Raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever. Who created the heaven and the things that are in it. And the earth and the things that are in it. He's, as he talks about God. And he's talking about God's word is going to be completed. He comes and there in verse 6, he says that there should be delay no longer. In other words, God is staying his hand, but the final judgment is coming. God is staying his hand. He's pulling back at the moment. He has sealed up those seven thunders, whatever they were. We don't know what they were. They are a mystery. We're not told what they were. But God pulled back. And, but the day is coming that there should be delay no longer. Verse 7. And in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel. When he is about to sound. That's talking about the bowls that are coming. The mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. In other words, God is going to finish the work of judging sin. He's staying his hand. You remember I told you these judgments are like a telescope. First, first section of the telescope was the seven seals. Then you open up a telescope to the next section and there were the seven trumpets. And then coming in chapter 16, it's going to open even further to the seven bowls. And God is going to finish his judgment on sin. And so, and so the angel declares that, and then we come to verse Eight. I'm trying to move as fast as I can. Are y'all getting this? Have I lost you? Pray for me. And so we come to verse 8. And something else interesting happens. And then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said. He's talking to John. So John hears this voice from heaven. So we believe that to be the voice of God. And he tells John. He gives him two Two instructions. Go and take the little book. That's a big angel. And God says go and take that little book from that big angel. I'm glad God didn't tell me to go and take a little book from a big angel. Especially the angel described here. But God gives him that instruction. And so... So he went to the angel and he said to him, give me the little book. I would have loved to have heard John's voice there. Mine would have been trembling and weak. Give me the little book. And he said to me, take and eat it and it will make your stomach bitter. But it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. You know, we're told in Psalm 119. In verse 103, that God's word is sweet as honey. Amen. He's telling John to go and to take his word from the angel. 
God's word is sweet. It's sweet like honey. It encourages. It points the way of salvation. It tells us that we have a God who loves us and pursues us. It gives us direction. God's word is sweet as honey, but it is also bitter to the stomach when we read about things we've read about in these last weeks of God's judgment. It hurts our heart and it's bitter. But it's all God's word. And what God is telling John, John, you have to take the whole counsel of my word. I'm a God of love. I'm a God of grace. I'm a God of mercy, but I'm also holy and I'm a God of judgment. It's sweet and it's bitter both at the same time. We don't like, we don't like it when God shows us our sin. It's bitter. We don't like it when it convicts us. It's bitter. But, but he instructed John to take this word, take it and eat it. And it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey. He is telling John to take it and eat it. To, to read it, to study it, to digest it. To, to learn how to, to interact with it and live it out. To let it impact his life. That's what God wants us to do with his word. Now, aren't you thankful God didn't make you go and take it from a big angel? You have a copy in your lap. But you know what God says to us? Eat it. Folks, in the days we're living in, you better be eating on God's word. You better get in it and read it like you've never read it before and study it like you've never studied before and hide it in your heart like you've never hid it before. The world is not getting any better. Are you with me? And so in verse 10, John says, Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and I ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. He was, he was, it was opening up to John all that was coming. And then... God, he gets another instruction. God gives him another instruction. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about the many peoples and the nations and the tongues and the kings. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And so the message John got was, John, you've seen what's coming. Now go and preach the gospel. That's the heart of the merciful God yet again, church. He pulled back his hand in these seven thunders. And he's telling John, listen, you need to understand what's coming. You need to understand the word and go and share this message. Share my gospel. That is the message to us today, church. We have a job to do. And it is to preach the gospel and share the gospel and love people and pray for people. And we don't have much time to do it. And we don't have much time to be distracted with things in eternity that aren't going to matter. I want to be a part of that preaching the gospel. I want you to be a part of that preaching the gospel. And if you're lost today, I want you to be saved. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? <coughs> Fathers, we come today. Lord, your word is powerful, it's living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, I pray that you promised that it would find its place and it would not return to you void. Lord, we claim that promise. Lord, open our eyes to the day we're living in and help us to see the blessing we still have. Time to come to faith in Christ. Time to preach your word. Time to pray. Time to be about your work, Lord. Help us not to be distracted. And the devil is trying his hardest.
to distract churches from their mission, to get believers upset with believers, to get our focus off of what we're called to do. Lord, I pray that you drive back every force of evil and darkness that's coming against us. And Lord, help us to be your church in these days we live in. Help us to keep the main thing the main thing, loving you with all our hearts, loving our neighbors as ourselves, and preaching your good news. And Father, I pray today for that one who may be here, who's never, never had assurance in their heart that they're born again and that they're saved. I pray with everything in me that you would give them the courage that, Lord, your Holy Spirit would work on them in such a way that they wouldn't be able to sit in that chair. And God, you would call them forward this morning to settle it in their hearts once and for all. And they would trust Christ to save them. Lord, I'm asking you to move among these, your people. Have your way in this invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.